Hello, and welcome to another lovely session of Civil Engineering with Tanya J. Laird. I am the aforementioned Tanya J. Laird. This video is the 11th in our wood design series, and this will be a relatively short, self-contained video exploring definitions of uh, moisture content in wood, some of its implications for strength, and its relation to the physical structure of wood as a material. Today's music comes from the artist Kilokaz from the album Free Ganymede. A uh, link is uh, posted in the description of the video. First, let's review the microstructure of wood that we discussed earlier in the series. The microstructure of wood has many implications for moisture content as a topic. Uh, shown here is a scanning electron microscope image of the typical microstructure of wood. Remember our favorite analogy we like to use. We can be thought of as a series of straws tightly bounded together. Uh, wood cells grow in this structure to provide strength and to allow for transport of water and nutrients longitudinally through the grain of the wood. So if I were to though, if I were to draw the direction of the grain, uh, the direction of the grain would go like this in these diagrams. Here's an idealized diagram of wood cellular structure. So how does moisture transfer actually work here? What you can notice is that the cells are highly elongated. Notice here, again, the cells are highly elongated. They're not just perfect, direct, they're not perfect cubes or perfect spheres, they're stretched out. But uh, let's go forward and think about wood as a single plant cell, or think about a single plant cell. This is just a idealized plant cell diagram from Wikipedia. Um, think back to basic biology. In order to function as a cell, a cell needs to have a clear boundary on all sides. So while I draw this, well, this is drawn here as almost looking like the cells have open ends, in reality, it has to have closed uh, ends all around it. Otherwise, it wouldn't be able to function as a cell. If it did, all of the internal organelles would flow out of the cell and the cell would completely cease to function. So with this in mind, uh, how does water and nutrients, or how do water and nutrients actually move through the grain of a tree or along the grain of a tree? So uh, think of a series of vertically aligned rectangles. Imagine each cell is a stretched out rectangle, um, a, a stretched out square or a long rectangle, probably more elongated than shown here even. So imagine this diagram here where each rectangle represents an individual wood cell. These cells might be aligned vertically, but they inevitably have cell walls, which act as horizontal barriers. So look here, for example. Here, here, here. The cells may be uh, very long and they may be oriented vertically, but they're inevitably going to have uh, barriers between them that makes transport within individual cells uh, very difficult. You're not going to have single cells that are let the length of an entire 200 foot tall tree. Each, uh, eventually one cell has to end and another one begin. And these cell walls serve as barriers to water and other nutrients uh, moving long distance through the cells themselves. In other words, water and nutrients cannot move along the grain of a tree simply by moving from one cell to another. So yeah, you might be able to get some movement from here to here a little bit, but you know, this is zoomed in quite a bit. So by the time you have, you know, these are microscopic cells. So by the time you have, you know, a hundred feet or 20 feet or 30 feet or however tall, however tall your tree is, by the time you have cell barrier after cell barrier after cell barrier after cell barrier, eventually you're not going to be able to transfer substantial nutrients and, and moisture uh, through the cell walls themselves. So you need to have some other mechanism of moving material uh, along the grain so, of a tree. Uh, if water can't move uh, within the cells themselves long distances, how does water actually move through a tree? We know that water has to be able to move, you know, we know that trees have to be able to transport water from their roots up to their upper branches, so they have to have some way of doing it. Well, let's go, let's go back to this diagram here. Uh, the longitudinal alignment of wood cells isn't just so water can move within a single cell. Rather, it sets up channels between cells. Wood cells grow within capillary tubes between them, the bulk transport of water happens exterior uh, to the wood cells uh, with the channels between them. So for example, look at this channel here, or this channel here, or all of these small tiny channels here. Those channels are not individual wood cells. It's not like this, this is not like a, 
these big circles, for example, are made of many, many, many cells that you can't see um, in the image. But basically, uh, individual cell walls, the way they're positioned, they set up their own, they set up channels in between them. So you'd have, you know, a cell here, a cell here, a cell here, a cell here, that sort of thing. And as they grow, they set up these channels within them that water can then move within. And that is ultimately how uh, wood is able to move water and other nutrients through its bulk structure. So this shows that there are really only two places that water can exist within the microstructure of wood. Cells as living things are always going to have some water within them, so you can find water, uh, some water within a given cell. Uh, so you can always find some water within a given cell. Second, you can find water between cells. So you can either find water within cells, shown here in red, and you can find water between cells, shown here in green. And, and this is important because this has direct implications for the moisture content in wood, as we will discuss. With that in mind, let's consider the actual definition of moisture content. Uh, in, in lumber and wood. So uh, first what I want to do is look at sort of an idealized case. So I would call this uh, an ideal formula. If I were to go and create an ideal formula for moisture content, I would say uh, the ideal moisture content is the moisture weight in a piece of lumber divided by the weight of the solids in that lumber. So if I could separate, if I had a piece of lumber and I could literally sort of like, a, imagine if I had sort of like a Star Trek, you know, teleporter or something, and I could just teleport all of the water, 100% of the water out of a piece of wood and put that into a beaker. And then I had that on one scale and then I could uh, have everything left over, the weight of the solids and weigh that on another scale that would be kind of the idealized way to do it. In, in a perfect world, I could directly measure the weight of the water or, or the weight of the moisture and then directly measure the weight of the solids. And then the ratio of those two times 100 would be my moisture content. However, as you probably can imagine, we do not have magical Star Trek teleporters or transporters. I guess I should say transporters, not teleporters, but um, I do not have an actual magic Star Trek transporter. So, I need to create some other way of actually measuring moisture content. And the first thing we can do is we can say, okay, instead of using something nebulous like the weight of solids, let's just use the oven dry weight. So what we'll do, if we want to measure moisture content in wood, we will heat it up to a high temperature for a prolonged period of time, drive off all the water that we can, and then uh, we'll, call, we'll call the oven dry weight the uh, weight of the solids. And then, then, uh, the quotient between that and the moisture weight will be its moisture content. However, I still have the problem of how do I go and define the moisture weight? Well, the way we do that is via subtraction. We define the moisture content as, or the moisture weight, I should say, as the moist weight of a piece of lumber minus its oven dry weight, and then divide that by the oven dry weight to get uh, a final moisture content expressed as a percent. So if you want to measure the moisture content of a piece of lumber, you first weigh it, and then you place it in an oven for a period of time to drive off all of the moisture that you can. Then you weigh it dry and calculate its moisture content. Of course, this doesn't mean that there is literally no water present in the wood. Uh, there's, oh, we, we do not actually have magic Star Trek teleporters, or transporters, I should say, I suppose. And uh, even putting something in an oven for 24 hours is not going to drive off 100% of the moisture present. So there's always going to be at least a few mo water molecules left over. So you can't ever truly have zero water present. Rather, we define zero moisture content as the moisture content that occurs when a piece of lumber has been oven dried. And oven drying is, it's, this is again one of those things uh, where it's its close enough for, our, for all intents and purposes. Um, after oven drying a piece of lumber, yes, there's probably a tiny, tiny, tiny 0.01% of moisture left over. We just define that as zero moisture content because for all intents and purposes, it is close enough. Um, however, this is usually a destructive process. You first need to cut the lumber uh, sample small enough to fit into a high temperature oven. 
and oven drying completely often causes uh, cracking and other destructive effects. Thus, there are some um, Thus, there are some non-destructive methods of measuring moisture content. For example, meters like this one uh, rely on conductive parameters, like, you know, electrical conductivity parameters, to measure moisture content. Um, meters like this one can never be as accurate as direct oven drying measurement, uh, but they do provide the benefit of being non-destructive. You can measure the moisture content of a piece of lumber without altering or destroying it. Or in other words, I can, if using a, a moisture content uh, meter like this one, I can walk right up to a, you know, a, a, P, a two by four that's already put in place on, uh, you know, in the framing of a building and I can measure its moisture content. This is never going to be as accurate as using an oven dried method, but it can be done in the field and it is non-destructive. And those are two very valuable things. And often, and in most cases, unless you're doing laboratory work, measuring moisture content with tools like this it's while not as pre exactly precise as using a lab uh you know astm oven drying specification is accurate enough for most purposes so let's work through this simple example shown here and uh this is going to give us if you, if you can't already see where this is going um this is going to give us some uh interesting results so a piece of green pine wood has a weight of 2.8 pounds after oven drying, it has a weight of 1.2 pounds. Uh, what was its moisture content, or what is the moisture content of this green wood? Well, we're just gonna use the simple formula of moisture content is equal to the uh, uh, moist weight, I'll, I guess I'll put down MW for moist weight, um, then I'll put OD for oven dry, over the oven dry weight times 100. So that's going to be, let's see, 2.8 pounds, uh, minus 1.2 pounds, divided by 1.2 pounds, and then multiply by 100 to convert to a percent, and I'll go ahead and throw that into my calculator, 2.8 minus 1.2 divided by 1.2, and I get a moisture content of 133%. I love this. I love this simply because at, at first it seems really counterintuitive. How can you have a, per, a percent content of something over 100%? And it just kind of, it's like, it's, uh, at first it kind of seems like you have like, imagine a pie chart and the percents are labeled, but if you add up all the percents, they add up to over 100%. That would just seem, if you saw a pie chart like that, you would know immediately that something was very wrong with some of those figures. And so at first, uh, having a moisture content over 100% seems insane, it seems ridiculous, it seems wrong. However, the key thing to remember is that this is a measure of moisture content, or, or how we define moisture content, is in relation to uh, moisture relative to solids. It's again, it's moisture relative to solids. So if you have something, like imagine the human body, for example. Uh, you probably heard that the human body is, uh, let's say, two-thirds water. Let's say that's actually 100% accurate. So let's say the... So let's assume for our example here uh, that the, um, the old uh, canard about the, water, the human body being two-thirds water is actually 100% correct. And uh, so we take a human body, we uh, weigh it, and then we oven dry it, and then we weigh it oven dried. Oh man, this is getting very grim all of a sudden, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, we want to be able to measure the moist the weight of the moisture in a body, or in a human body, or in the human body, divided by the weight of the solid material in it. So, um, we need to do we need to be able to apply the formula M W minus O D, uh, o -D divided by O D. Well, um, I don't need to use actual, I'm just going to go ahead and use the fractions here. I don't actually need to use the, uh, the units for pounds or kilograms, or whatever units you might, you might be using for weight or mass, because those would cancel out anyway, so I can just use the fractions. So, um, for, if we're talking about the fraction of a human body being two-thirds water, well, the overall MW, the moist weight, would be one. Then, uh, the oven dry weight would be one third, because if the, if the human body is one third, or sorry, if the human body is two thirds water, 
when I uh, if, when I oven dry the human potty and separate and drive that moisture off, I will be left with one third after subtracting two thirds from the original whole, and then the oven dry weight will just be one third. So I'll basically in the numerator I'll have two thirds, the denominator will have one third, and I'll be left with a moisture content of two hundred percent. So, while it may seem odd to have a moisture content over 100%, you have to realize it's relative to, it's, the, it's, it's not relative to, uh, it's not a percent measured in relative to the whole, it's a percent measured in relative, it's a, it's a moisture content percent uh, measured relative to the weight of solids. So, if you, uh, I'm just using the familiar example, uh, I just use the familiar example here of the human body being uh, two thirds water, but that would correspond to a moisture content as we're defining it of 200%. So um, wood moisture content is one of the few things where you actually can have uh, percents uh, far greater than 100%. So let's consider some key moisture content values. There are a few terms to be aware of. Remember back to what we said about how wood can store moisture in its microstructure. It can store water either within its cell walls or uh, within capillaries outside, outside of them. Or in other words, it can either store uh, it can either store water within cells or uh, in the capillaries outside of cells. So first, consider a tree right after it, you cut it down. This is referred to as green wood, and it shouldn't come as a surprise that this is where wood will typically be at its maximum moisture content. As we mentioned, there's the old uh, saying of the human body being two thirds water, and living trees are uh, really no different. A, a living tree will typically have the majority of its weight be water, and thus its moisture content, as we've seen, will often be over 100% um, right when it's green wood and when it's cut down. So let's say you start the you start seasoning a piece of wood. Let's say you air dry it. Um, think again about where wood can store moisture, both within cell walls and in the capillaries between them. Uh, where is water most likely to be lost first? So, um, think about this. Is it going to be easier to lose water from within a cell or outside of a cell? Well, it's going to be lost most easily from the capillaries and cavities between cells. Um, that's gonna, it's going to be a lot easier to drive water off from outside of cells than within individual cells. Um, cells have all sorts of osmotic structures and organelles and things within them that like to tightly cling to water so if water is driven, so water is first driven off from the capillaries between cells, as shown in green here, rather than within the interiors of cells uh, labeled in the red circle here. And so this water that is between cells is referred to as free water. So free water is water that is contained in the cavities between wood cells, in the cavities and capillaries between wood cells. Um, eventually, as you drive more and more water off, as say you're air drying it or oven drying it, you drive out, eventually you drive out all of the water that is between cells. Uh, this point is referred to as the fiber saturation point or the FSP. So FSP is probably something you, it, you'll you see often when uh, reading on uh, uh, topics of lumber and wood. At the fiber saturation point, all of the free water has been driven off. Then, as you drive it out further, you move on to the moisture that is contained within the wood cells themselves. Uh, this water is referred to as bound water. Um, bound water will leave wood after the free water does. So again, the, the first thing that happens is that you drive off the uh, free water that is contained with, with outside of individual cells. Then once you pass the fiber saturation point, you start driving off the bound water. Finally, as you keep drying lumber out, eventually you have to hit a point where the drying process is complete. Um, this is referred to as the equilibrium moisture content or the EMC. Eventually lumber is in osmotic balance with the air around it, so no net moisture is either entering or leaving it. And there, you know, obviously there will be some, if you remember back to chem chemistry and equilibrium discussions and such, um, if you have a piece of lumber, there's always some some water molecules constantly leaving it and some constantly entering it, but at the equilibrium moisture content, as much as leaving as is entering. So, um, and this equilibrium content will, will in almost all cases 
be above the zero moisture content. Because remember, zero moisture content is defined by the oven dry weight. So equilibrium moisture content will only be zero while it is physically sitting in a high temperature, you know, zero humidity oven. The moment it's taken out of this oven, it will begin to seek equilibrium with the air around it and its moisture content will slowly rise above zero. And all of this is explained here in this diagram from uh, Breyer. So notice we start out here um, at a uh, high moisture content, likely well over 100%, um, with a, the moisture content in a piece of green lumber or a, um, or a living tree. And we cut it down and start air drying it or kiln drying it. And as we go down, as we go down lower moisture content, uh, first you're going to drive off the free water. Then you're going to hit the fiber saturation point. Then you're going to start driving off the bound water. And then finally, you're going to hit some equilibrium moisture content. And that's going to be your final moisture content that uh, as long as the uh, humidity around the given piece of lumber remains at that value, the internal moisture content will remain at that. And so, um, and that's going to be somewhere above the zero moisture content, which is again, only achieved if you're oven drying it. So again, this is only well, well in an oven, essentially. So unless your piece of lumber is literally sitting in an oven, its moisture content, its equilibrium moisture content, will be somewhere between the fiber saturation point and uh, the zero moisture content. So again, thus equilibrium moisture content of a piece of lumber will be somewhere between the fiber saturation point and the zero uh, moisture content point. Uh, next, we should discuss moisture content and its relation to material strength. Uh, moisture content does have a strong impact on wood strength. Uh, as you dry lumber out, it will generally increase in strength. Uh, wood typically reaches uh, maximum strength at a moisture content between 10 and 15 percent. Um, or more specifically, or more precisely, as shown in this diagram from the Site Engineering Toolbox, uh, this is a uh, this is a diagram of of relative uh, max compressive strength versus moisture content for a series of uh, representative curves for a series of different types of woods, such as dug fir, pine, red spruce, etc. And um, and the exact relationship is going to vary um, substantially depending on what uh, depending on what property you're looking at, whether you're looking at tensile stress, uh, bending capacity, uh, moment you know uh, not sorry, not moment. Uh, compressive capacity, shear, etc., each will exhibit their own precise relationship between, um, between moisture content and, um, between moisture content and strength, but they will all follow the general pattern of, um, that the lower the moisture content, the higher a, a, tip a given strength value typically will be. Although, uh, generally, as you can notice here, as you go from, you know, as you go here from, you know, 30, let's label this, as you go from 30 to say around, you know, this looks like 7 or so in this graph, you get, you're still getting pretty good returns on uh, a lower moisture content leading to higher strength, but once you start getting to the 5, 10, 15% range, uh, especially the 5 to 10% range, uh, you start, it, it, you stop really seeing such clear um, increases in strength. You start to having that law of diminishing returns type thing you can't really get a whole lot of additional strength simply because there's not much water there to drive off anymore and you don't really get a lot of further benefits. So the exact point of that leveling off is going to depend on what property you're looking at, but um, anywhere between say 5 and 15% is where the uh, strength, the maximum strength for a given property will occur. Also, and that again is dependent on the type of loading you're looking at and also um, the species and um, section properties, and a variety of other factors. Next, I'd like to look at moisture content and humidity. As we mentioned, wood will eventually seek an equilibrium with its environment. You can kiln dry a piece of wood, but eventually it is inevitably going to hit equilibrium with the air around it. Wood is a porous material. Uh, air can flow into it, and air can flow out of it. Um, unless you, you know, seal a piece of wood up within, you know, an inch of, with, with like a, you know, inch thick steel plate or something, it's going to be in, it's going to be continuously interacting 
with the air around it. So, um, you can kill and dry a piece of wood, but it inevitably is going to hit some sort of equilibrium with the air around it after you take it out of the kiln. I found this table on the website of the Wagner Meter Company. Air humidity and wood moisture content are calculated differently and have many different variables involved, so there's not one single formula for directly converting uh, in-service humidity levels to equilibrium moisture content in wood. You can't just say, oh, uh, the humidity in this room is, you know, 19.2%, so the equilibrium moisture content for a piece of lumber placed in this room will be exactly 5.4% or something. There's not a simple relationship to, to, with there because there's there's not a simple math there's not a simple mathematical relationship there because there's a lot of variables dealing with temperature and uh, species of wood, dimensional sizes, things like that. So um, again, there's not a simple way to directly convert from one to the other. However, it can be seen that the higher the humidity in a location, the higher the equilibrium moisture content. And this really shouldn't be seen as any kind of surprise. Next, I'd like to talk about moisture content and deterioration. Uh, moisture content is one of the primary factors controlling decay in wood and wood products. Wood and fungal decay are biological processes, and no biological process, at least on this planet, I suppose, um, can occur without water present. Maybe around some distant sun there's some exotic life form that doesn't use water, but anything on Earth, at least, is... Uh, if it's biological, it needs water. Thus, it is paramount to protect wood used in structural applications. Uh, it's important to protect it in order to keep it from getting wet. Uh, air, and snow, uh, air inside a building's conditioned envelope will easily meet this criteria, assuming it's all properly uh, insulated and conditioned and uh, sealed, etc. Um, but wood exposed to moisture can eat can uh, easily gain a, a, an interior moisture content that is too high. Thus, especially for wood and exterior purposes, care must be taken to make sure it can adequately dry off uh, after being rained on. So if you have a piece of lumber that is inevitably going to have some rain on it, so for example, a, a, an outdoor deck, um, you need to design that in such a way that water won't pool on it, that water will be able to flow off of it, and that um, after the rain has gone away, that it can dry out. Um, and so again, if it's going to have moisture, uh, uh, if it's something is going, if a piece of lumber is going to be exposed to, wo uh, to water, you need to make sure that it will dry out um, uh, fairly quickly. If water remains trapped long term, rot and fungal decay can set in. Now, the cutoff point depends, of course, on species, condition, temperature, etc. But generally, if moisture content is above, 10, uh, above say, oh, 20 to 30 percent, wood decay becomes a risk. Um, controlling uh, moisture content and protecting wood is a primary concern in wood construction, and great care needs to be taken to protect uh, wood from, from water from both the weather and from moisture in the soil. And we will certainly discuss this more as we move through the course. Now, the NDS does provide certain limits on moisture content for uh, structural applications. For example, consider here NDS provision 4.1.4. For sawn lumber, in-service moisture content is limited to 19%. Thus, you generally have to design your wooden building and its weather sealing and protection such that all of the structural members within it will have a final equilibrium moisture content of less than 19%. If you don't do this, then the NDS penalizes you and you're not allowed to load your wooden members to the same level. If your in-service moisture content will be more than 19%, you have to apply what's known as a wet service factor, and we'll discuss that uh, more in later videos. Now that 19% isn't generally that difficult to hit as long as, your, uh, as long as your building environment, or I should say building envelope, is properly sealed. If you have a building and it's conditioned and even if it's not air conditioned, I suppose, as long as there's not, as long as there is a roof over it and it is properly sealed from the elements, it's usually not that hard to get a final equilibrium moisture content uh, less than 19%. All right, and with that, I think we'll wrap up here for the day. As we've seen, the moisture content in wood is a complex thing that relates directly to its origins as a biological material. 
Managing moisture content is very important to protecting wood from degradation, and wood strength generally increases as moisture content decreases, at least up to a, a certain point. Uh, hopefully you found this video helpful and informative. If you did, please like, comment, and subscribe to make the robots happy. If you want to help make content like this possible, see the link to our Patreon page in the video description. Our next video will be a direct follow-on to this one, covering the topic of shrinkage in wood that results from the drying and seasoning process. I hope to see you all then, and I hope you'll join me for that next discussion. I look forward to seeing you all then, and as always, thank you.